Oh, you know. You know what you're doing. I mean, we, this man knows exactly what he's doing. The Wrestling Life. Hey everybody, it's The Wrestling Life, episode 281. It is the final week now of October 2021. I'm Ethan. And I'm Liam. Liam, we have so much to talk about this week. We really, really do. And as always, so many things that we cannot talk about right here on the first and the only wrestling podcast. So I know you're chopping a bit to talk about the uh, Charlotte Flair Becky Lynch situation for Friday Night Smackdown this week. Ladies and gentlemen, in more ways than one, the 1990s are back in the pro wrestling business. <laughs> we have a wrestling war. We have two of the top stars in WWE who can't stand each other and are blurring the lines of work and shoot on live television. What a wonderful time to be alive. Becky, and, Becky Lynch and Charlotte Flair were scripted to exchange their championships on Friday Night SmackDown. <laughs> Hilarious for a number of reasons. <laughs> but things apparently did not go as planned. There was an incident in the ring. There was a backstage argument afterwards. Charlotte was escorted out of the building <laughs> while Becky Lynch worked a dark <laughs> match against Bianca Belair at the SmackDown tapings this week. Whoa, boy, is there a lot to unpack here. Yeah, I mean, this is fascinating for a ton of reasons. One, because nothing this interesting has happened in WWE in like, I don't know, 20 years. <laughs> like, and then on top of that, it's like, yeah, it's two top stars who are, you know, theoretically the, the cornerstones or anchors of their respective women's divisions on each show. And they apparently have longer term beef than was originally realized this this incident on friday is not apparently the first time they've had words or that their relationship has been strained after they had previously been very very good friends so it's yep. like there's a lot of brett and sean in this when you think about that because there's always that story of, of you know brett and sean being pretty close years earlier and then and then you know as their their paths sort of continued to cross it got it sort of just deteriorated and That appears to have been sort of the same thing that's happened with Becky. And then, yes, all the way coming to a head to an extent in this bit of of Charlotte and Becky. Supposedly, they were going to hand the belts to each other. But then Charlotte, like, I mean, there's no question about it. Like, it's not like there was a miscommunication. Like, she was supposed to hand the belt to Becky. (laughs) She pulled it away. She made Becky look like an idiot. Like, like that. And like on purpose. And and then Becky, who maybe this part was scripted. I know this was like back and forth, but then Becky threw the be- threw her belt at Charlotte very hard. She really pitched a fastball on that one, and yeah. Charlotte let that belt drop to the floor as well. And then they Becky just kind of left, and they did their show closing angle to turn Sasha babyface and set up, I guess theoretically what the program for the for the women's championship on smackdown will be going forward that is assuming (laughs) that you know charlotte isn't suspended or something else and so that does it leads to a bunch of questions which is especially considering survivor series in a few weeks theoretically becky and charlotte are going to be wrestling each other on that show so Mm -hmm. this there's like a lot to unpack and then there's the stuff like well (laughs) Does WWE want her? Like, did, are they mad at her? Do they want her gone? Does she want to be there? Like, there's a lot, uh, you know, as far as Charlotte, does Charlotte want to even want to be in WWE anymore? Like, is she trying to get, get fired? Like, there's a lot to unpack here. And it's, like I said, just it's just the most interesting thing that's happened in WWE, and I couldn't tell you how long. Yeah, the... Prior to this, probably the most interesting thing was when Naya and Charlotte started shooting on each other in the ring. <laughs> a lot of problems with Charlotte, it seems. Yeah, I mean, and you can go back from there to the, the Kyrie Sane incident with Charlotte a couple of years ago where Kyrie was concussed and it seemed pretty clear to everyone except Charlotte that she was concussed, who 
began slapping her and insisted on power bombing her through a table on the floor. Um, yep. and, and I guess that was part of some of the, the scuttlebutt that came out afterwards. It was like there was this initial report by PW Insider and then Alex McCarthy, who I don't know what site he works for, <laughs> but he was the guy who previously set the record straight on Charlotte being pregnant. Yes. So you can guess where maybe he got his side of that story from. Mm-hmm. Um, and then that was sort of countered by, I believe, a Fightful report as well as in a PW torch fort that came out. And uh, so it, it does not seem that people within WWE, or at least not most of the people there saw anyone uh, really saw Charlotte as like the hero of this piece here. So it seems like there's a, there's the battle lines are pretty well drawn and the, the Charlotte camp, so to speak is a, uh, is a little on the light side. However, the two people in the Charlotte, or the three people in the Charlotte camp, the four people in the Charlotte camp are Triple H. I'm not sure if that matters as, as much as it used to. <laughs> Kevin Dunn, Bruce Pritchard, and Vince McMahon. So she still has the important people, as far as we know. Although it was reported that Vince was upset that Charlotte apparently did not speak to him after the incident at SmackDown on Friday. There's four million layers to this. There is also like that 5% chance in the back of my head that is like, you know, they, as you mentioned, are theoretically going to do Becky versus Charlotte at Survivor Series in a month. Could they be working this? But I, it's a long way to go to try to work something like this. So it does. I, I don't think it is, but that's another fun layer to it. For sure. I mean, that's always the fun part of this. If it's not, or if it's not a work, it could become a work, you know, like thinking this, it could yep. very quickly become one if it's not, if it's not already. So that much like, you know, a couple of years ago. And it's also one of the things like, well, were there cameras rolling during that? Because if you'll remember when they, they famously did the Brock doesn't love the biz uh, storyline a couple of years ago, part of that was to like, they had Brock throw, like throw the belt at Vince McMahon's head Oh, and, and you know, cameras just happened to be there to capture that. And <laughs> right, right. You know, and he was. They had him. You know, quote unquote, no showing all of those shows and everything. So, like sometimes they're like they take elements from maybe what are real or what is perceived to be the real life, uh, real life angles or real life heat of oh, Brock doesn't want to be there, or in this case, maybe it's you know Charlotte's, you know really concerned about it's only concerned about protecting her own spot or whatever, you know, whatever the narratives are uh, surrounding her and that that is, and that they could take some of those elements that may in fact be real and then make it a storyline. So there's, there's a lot to this. And then there's the other fun part of this that we, we discussed off the air, which is you could have just taken the belts off both of these people <laughs> at any time between SummerSlam and Friday night when they did that including on Monday when Charlotte defended her raw title in the main event of that show. And they did a DQ and then uh, (laughs) Becky defended the SmackDown belts on, uh, on the crown jewel show on Thursday and won that match. So they, and there was someone from the SmackDown brand wrestling in that match that could have won that belt, or you could have stripped them of the titles or (laughs) you could have just never had them win the titles. (laughs) There's a hundred things you could have done here. And they chose to do this weird uh, ceremony of exchanging the belts. And it went, it went off the rails. Like it would have been weird and awkward, even if it went entirely to plan, but it was also, there's just all of these added layers and yes. And then maybe the icing on the cake being after the argument, I guess, Charlotte trying to plead her case and say that her dropping the belt was an accident and security telling her get your stuff and go like <laughs> that's that's a pretty wild way to like again unless unless we find out this was you know the cameras were rolling and this was all part of it that i can't think of a time where i've read about a wwe a top wwe star being escorted out of the building i i mean yeah. i get that it was the end of the show and maybe they thought but like things would escalate physically if she was still there when Becky got back from the dark match or whatever. I don't know, 
But right. like there was clearly some reason where they were like, she needs to be out of this building now. Yeah. Yeah. I think that was one of the many sites that reported on this was basically that was their, the fear. I think it was Fightful reported. That was the fear that like mm-hmm. if, if she was still, you know, in the locker room cleaning up or whatever after the, the show and when Becky came back, like it could have escalated. So, yeah, but uh, everybody pretty much uh, universally takes Becky Lynch's side in this, except Charlotte and Andrade. <laughs> <laughs> Has, has Rick chimed in or whoever tweets for Rick? Has he chimed in yet? <sighs> Not that I'm aware of, but uh, Rick does the thing where he tries to uh, kiss everybody's ass. <laughs> yeah, it's, so. yeah, I guess he's not really in a position where he uh, <laughs> wants to churn out any potential future meal tickets yeah, either, either which way. So, but yeah, I mean, there is he, he, that's another level he, to this, right? Is that like she has Rick theoretically and andrade as her sounding board and what do you think they're telling her rick having recently (laughs) you know just pre-canceling getting you know getting his release for wwe and andrade demanding and not getting and then very suddenly getting his release with no uh 90 day no compete clause in it probably based on the workings of charlotte earlier this year yeah, like there's a lot to this, and like, yeah, I so like, what do you think her her camp again is telling her? Like, obviously, it's one of those things where you wouldn't you would go, well, there's no chance they would fire her or probably even suspend her. One because you know she would go to the other show, and two because right. that the way they book their women's division, who are they gonna who are they gonna book? Like, who are they gonna put on SmackDown every week if if she's gone? But you would also maybe have thought that like Bray Wyatt wouldn't have been someone they would look to fire and or Braun Strowman or some of those people who also probably made them more money, like just on a dollars and cents basis as far as like merchandise and stuff. And right. those people are gone. So like and then there's also the element as, as we talked about, like, what does she want? What does she what right. how is she, what does she feel right now? If she feels like she's public enemy number one and nobody has her back and like, what is that? You know, I don't, I don't know what her current deal is. I don't know when she could leave if she wants to leave and they don't want her to. So years, Mm -hmm. (laughs) it would, it would be years. She'd have to sit out years (laughs) or forego years of pay. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's like, there's so many, (laughs) it's one of those things where it doesn't feel like this can be resolved anytime soon. Like you can, you can kind of alleviate it a little bit by keeping them on separate shows. But, but if it's not just a Charlotte Becky thing and it's uh, the entire, (laughs) the entire women's locker room and Charlotte thing, as we've pointed out, she's had issues with not just Becky publicly recently right. and god knows what else privately like this could be a really weird and tumultuous time for for that locker room yeah it's a lot of fun so they had uh they had <laughs> crown jewel this week also the famous thursday afternoon pay-per-view uh apparently the best in-ring crown jewel yet a very low bar but um i tell you what uh roman reigns and brock lesnar uh, there was a lot of action in that match. I don't care for that match, the Paul Heyman match layout. Uh, to, I don't care to ever see that match layout again, mm-hmm. but it wasn't bad. So there's that. And uh, Edge and Seth Rollins had a really great Hell in a Cell match. So if you're going to watch a wrestling show at noon on a Thursday, you know, <laughs> Crown Jewel is a pretty good one to watch. Did you get a chance to see any of it? Yeah, so I, I did not see the full show, but I did watch the opener. I watched the main event, and I watched uh, I watched Goldberg and Bob, and I really liked the vibe they had in that Goldberg match because it felt like you know how like once a year like Liam Neeson or some other like aging action star gets a movie where it's like a guy fifteen years younger than him does something bad, and then it's just a movie of this old man, this old frail old man beating the tar out of people 20 years younger than him. Yes. I feel like that's the vibe they were going for and succeeded (laughs) and, and succeeded in presenting with Goldberg on this, in this match with, of him just mostly it was just him. I mean, Bob, Bob got the heat early and then it was just Goldberg wailed on him for like five minutes and beat him. And they did a big stunt 
with a spear off the stage at the finish. So I was like, yeah, that was, they told a story, which is, you know, Goldberg is old and isn't maybe as strong as Bob, but he was fighting with the righteous anger of a man whose son got put in a full Nelson. So, you know, I thought, I thought that was probably Bob or uh, Goldberg's best match at least since probably that first run. So there was that's sure. something. What's Goldberg's kid's name? A rifle, gauge, shotgun. <laughs> Miller Light. Shotgun Goldberg, I think is the kid's name. His name is Tractor. <laughs> Tractor. And you can still do Bill and Tractor against MVP and Bob somewhere down the line if you want. Although they're not going to put a kid who's not 18 in the ring yet. So I don't know how uh, young uh, Rifle is, but <laughs> maybe at some point we get that. Yeah. I mean, you got Bill for like two matches a year for two more years or something. So we'll get we'll get him in something. <laughs> it's, it's fantastic. All right. Uh, G1 wrapped up this week. Okada won the G1. Ibushi dislocated his shoulder in the main event of finals of the G1 is absolutely cursed promotion because he used to be cursed. <laughs> Although is it really a curse when you, when you um, run an, on un, an unsustainable schedule with a bunch of 35 to 45 year old guys all the time? No, it's not a, it's not a curse. <laughs> it's, you're, you're bringing it on the cell. It, you're bringing it on yourself is just the consequences of your actions. Yeah, there's you know there's a little bit of that Johnny Cash God's gonna cut you down thing, right? Like they've been <laughs> they've been yeah. getting away with it for a while now, both relying on older talent and then you know the less foreigners have been able to get into the country, the more these 36, 37, 38 year olds have been asked to work, you know, you know, a bunch of nights a week, if not, you know, weeks, weeks and weeks straight and months and months. And it's like, yeah, the 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 miles the miles pile up as they say and it's like yeah it's it sucks like it sucked to see that and i think it was just like specifically with ibushi because he is like this magical terminator man who has landed on his neck more times than i can count and hopped right back up i think that's what made it so jarring to see was that he was just like went down didn't get up and then was you know had like tears in his eyes and was just screaming like that was that was what i think was like oh he's human like that was that was maybe the thought i had and and then but yeah as you laid it out from a logical standpoint you know if it wasn't abushi obviously naito already missed this tournament because of his injuries and it's 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 gonna keep happening with as the more you rely you know okada's been banged up all year and is kind of been fighting through stuff and it's it's gonna it's gonna get worse because you know you don't generally have less injuries when you're working that many days a year and you're getting older like so um you know abushi yeah you look at it more as like oh the magic spell abushi was under finally ran out and (laughs) and on something as simple as as you mentioned it wasn't a german suplex on the apron or something or it's like it's a miss phoenix splash that you've seen him do that spot a hundred times and it's never a problem. It's just, well, sometimes it's not how you land. It's just that you've landed in that way too many, one time too many. And this time the, the sock, you know, the bone popped out of the socket. Yeah. It's good. Good point. You make that he's like, he has been a video game character or an action figure. Like he's literally built like an Mm -hmm. action figure. (laughs) It's like, he's been that for so long that it's like, yeah. Yeah, he's but he's uh he's a 40 year old dude, so stuff happens. But uh, Okada wins the G1, wrestles uh Tamatanga, the absolute state of this company, <laughs> wrestles Tamatanga here in two weeks, uh, defends the title shot. Shingo defends the world title against Zack Sabre. So, guys losing a G1, setting up matches for the November pay per view, then we're into a couple tournaments for the end of the year, then we're on to the f- three night Wrestle Kingdom in january super exciting that's right and then uh i'm guessing katsuyori shibata is gonna wrestle on one of those wrestle kingdom shows i don't know man i don't know yeah so shibata who had a brain bleed 
four and a half years ago mm-hmm. and has not wrestled since was forced to retire has been head coach of new Japan's dojo in Los Angeles since like the beginning of 2018. I think um, he came back and did a quote unquote exhibition match against Zack Sabre jr. A five minute exhibition at the G one finals. He pretty much only took one bump and it was a bump that he took himself after the match and promised that next time you see him in the ring, he'll have another match. And for a guy who was told you're not going to be cleared ever again, because you uh, suffered bleeding on the brain Mm -hmm. from doing repeated headbutts. uh, Probably doesn't seem like a very good idea for him to be doing matches again. But it also feels like New Japan's doing this weird dip their toe in the water thing. Like very clearly, they put him in there with Zack Sabre Jr. is absolutely the safest guy you could possibly put him in there with. Mm-hmm. And they did it five minutes and they told him don't take any bumps. And he didn't. And, you know, Tomawaki Homa is proof that maybe that they will clear guys who shouldn't be cleared to wrestle and they haven't suffered the consequences from that yet either, but just seems like a very, as good as he looked and he did look very good. Kostiri Shibata looked very good in, mm-hmm. in there with Zach Sabre Jr. Seems like a pretty bad idea to let him wrestle again. Yeah. I just, you know, like if you remember, I guess this was setting up wrestle kingdom 2020 when Kenta joined the bullet club at that previous year's G one or whatever. They did a bit where af- after he turned on his partners or whatever, Shibata came out and just beat the tar out of him. And he did like the running kick in the corner. And then he did mm-hmm. the, the, the big drop kick with, with Kenta sitting down. And I don't, I don't remember. I've, and they didn't really bump him though. Like, I mean, I guess you could consider the big jumping, leaping drop kick a bump, but you know, when, when it was time to get the heat on him, like Kenta just put him in a sleeper hold and brought him down to the ground and they, you know, stomped him. Like they didn't, they didn't right. give him. They didn't give him a move, and everyone thought at the time, and it was a great angle, and everyone was like, "Oh, oh my, oh my gosh, is is Shibata coming back for Wrestle Kingdom?" And then they did like Kenta versus Goto, and yeah. and nothing ever seemed to come of it. So I think that's part of it that caught me so off guard. Other than the fact that it just kind of randomly popped up in this on this show unannounced, but also that. Yeah, I felt like they flirted with this a couple of years ago and maybe decided Mm -hmm. not to go down that road. Of course, you can also say, hey, they were they had more talent available to them at that point in time that they don't know when it's going to if or when those people will be coming back. And so maybe they feel like, hey, we got three dome shows. And if Shibata says he's good and we can find a doctor to clear him, then yeah, it could just be, I'd hate to think it would be something as, as sinister and gross as just, we got to sell tickets to this half full dome or half empty dome show. We're going to do uh, one of the three nights, but it does feel like, well, what has changed two years on or whatever from that, from that point where they previously teased his comeback. Yep. Uh, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. If there's a silver lining or a bright side here for New Japan, uh, Australia is um, loosening some of their travel restrictions. Mm -hmm. Uh, You won't need to quarantine to enter Australia anymore. You just need to to provide a negative COVID test. So if, if countries follow, um, you know, Australia's lead or what have you, then maybe getting into and out of Japan will not be the ordeal that it has been for the last year and a half now. Yeah. I mean, fingers crossed if there's as safe as you can be while still, while still traveling during a, you know, a global pandemic with a, you know, a virus that has mutated multiple times and will probably continue to do so. Like, yeah, I mean, that would, that would at least free them up to not, have to rely so much on these these aging broken down men that are (laughs) that are quite literally giving slowly giving their lives for these shows so that they can wrestle (laughs) in front of you know 200 people and and uh that can't make any noise so well on a brighter note aew the bobby fish show (laughs) we had our second consecutive week of friday night rampage saturday night dynamite this week 
uh, this week uh, Rampage was taped and Dynamite was live. I think that's how it went. Mm-hmm. It was, uh, but anyway, a lot of Bobby Fish on these shows. He's the shiny new toy. And um, to me, I don't know. Just uh, we, we can talk big picture AEW stuff. They, they've announced a few matches for their November 13th pay-per-view. Uh, Omega and Hangman, of course, for the world title. Britt and Tay Conti for the women's title. And not officially announced yet, but FTR versus the Lucha Bros for the... Or Lucha Bros defending the AEW tag titles against uh, FTR. Um, uh, whatever else from that lead card that ends up on the show. But to me, the booking of AEW has felt... Um, it's a lot more it's a it's felt less cohesive and a lot more they have so much talent it's just like let's just do let's just mix and match dream match kind of things mm-hmm. and not that not that bobby fish having a dream having a match with anybody is a dream match <laughs> a dream match for anyone whose last name isn't fish but i will say i do like the anybody can wrestle anybody and we can mix and match a lot of different pieces and have a lot of fun matches. But uh, I, do, I don't think it's necessarily like, aside from the Hangman and Kenny thing, I don't think there's like a lot of great stories being told. It just feels like a lot of mixing and matching. What do you think of, the, mm-hmm. of that idea? What do you think of AEW right now? Yeah, I think that about covers it. Like we've gotten um some tremendous matches in the last week obviously we didn't do a show last week but there was the danielson suzuki match um this week on rampage i thought pack and andrade this is without a doubt the best andrade match since he left the company or since he left wwe for sure probably since those (laughs) matches with ray a couple years ago um best best he's looked in a long long time best pack match in probably over a year as well probably since that match he had with kenny on television so like both of those guys looked great. You had a great that great Danielson match this week on Dynamite. You had uh, you know, Danielson and Dustin Rhodes of all people just tore the house down. Like so, you're definitely right in that you're having a lot of fun matches, and every week seemingly on the show there's a weird match where you're like, wow, that's a like next week they're gonna do Dan- uh, they're doing Brian Danielson and Eddie Kingston. That sounds awesome. Um, you know, they're, they're, di- and I think based on where these finals are going, you're either going Danielson versus Moxley or Danielson versus Orange Cassidy. And both of those sound super fun. Um, honestly, I think I'd rather see the Orange Cassidy one, but, um, <laughs> that's not a, that's not necessarily a knock on Moxley. I just think that would be fun. And I think one of the things about the Danielson run specifically that I've liked is every match he's had for the most part, with the exception, I would say of the fish match which felt like a less good version of his Suzuki match. Uh, all of the matches have felt pretty different so far. You know, the, the Kenny match felt different than the, the Nick Jackson match to the, you know, to down these matches with Dustin and Suzuki. Like he's, he's having a good variety of wrestling matches, which is super fun. But to your point is, uh, as far as like bigger stories being told, yes, you have the hangman and Kenny thing, which is probably enough by itself for like, you know, AEW fans who have been watching for a while to, to, you know, plunk down their money for your show. But yeah, as, as you look around, it's like, okay, we're going to do MJF and Darby, I guess is going to be on the show, or maybe it's MJF and Wardlow versus Darby and Sting since Sting got laid out this week. Um, they're doing a American top team inner circle match. Uh, like there's stuff. And some of it's, you know, in some cases, like the Kenny and Hangman stuff, they're paying off a very theoretically are paying off or are at least doing the next big chapter of this long term storyline. But it does. And then you look at like the women's division where they have a tournament going on for this TBS belt. And then aside from that, they just kind of very quickly threw together Ty Conti and Dr. Britt Baker, uh, who are, I think, are feuding over who has a better ass. Um, yeah, and I don't right. know the answer to that question. Who has a better one? Cause I'm, I'm, I'm always too busy respecting these women, uh, to notice such a thing, but, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't, uh, so yeah, I think there's parts of the show that feel good, but also 
tournaments also, I think, give you an excuse. So if you have two tournaments going on <laughs> on your show at once, that kind of is like a get out of jail free card where you don't have to book storylines for a month. You yes. know, so and again, it's a, and a, it, the result, as you said, is some really cool, fun matches that you don't need a deep storyline reason to have. But then it also results in the people that aren't in the tournament are kind of just like hanging out like we don't yeah. like Miro is is still cutting promos on the show, but he doesn't really have a direction. You don't you know, you don't necessarily know what what happens to the losers. Like if Orange Cassidy loses to Moxley. What do you, what does he do at the pay-per-view today? I guess, I guess maybe they're going to pay off the Matt Hardy hair match thing or whatever, but it's like, so it is that thing where the guys not advancing in the tournament then are kind of standing there with their hands in their pockets, literally in some cases. Yes. Quite literally in the case of Orange Cassidy. All right. Uh, Hey, I, I don't think stories are necessarily their strong suit. So I'm totally (laughs) fine with this direction, by the way, you know, good for them. I mean, who tells good stories in wrestling anymore? It's, it, stories are passe in wrestling now, right? We don't, we don't really tell we movies, pal. That's right. Yeah. No, and like I said, I think you'll get you'll get that in the Kenny and Hangman match. And if that's enough for you as a fan, and you're like, hey, you're going to get some rich storytelling in one feud, and the rest of the show is just going to be some matches that we kind of toss together. Um, then that's great. And, but if you're looking for like a more cohesively each week builds really well into next week's show type of storyline, I don't, yeah, I don't think AEW is necessarily the, the weekly television show for you. But I, I think as we've talked about many times in the past, uh, that less than cohesive booking stuff and storyline stuff is a lot more forgivable when you know you're going to get one, maybe two really good to great matches every week. And so you do have that AEW does have that going uh, for them and will conceivably be able to keep doing new, fresh, good matches, at least one a week, every week for, you know, in perpetuity for a while here. So they do have that going for them. And I do think that does that lessens it than say when you don't have good stories being told and there's not a lot of good wrestling on the show, then it, I think that's when it really starts to feel like a slog to get through. All right. A thousand percent. Yeah. Yeah, the extent of the extent of the storytelling on the show is there's a match. After the match, there's a run in to set up the match yes. on the next show. <laughs> like that's that's how they book. Yeah, I mean, I think like I guess like they're trying to do a, like I think the the FTR stuff like there's that's more of a maybe like a it's ninety good. That, no that's like that <laughs> that to me feels like that that feels like a 90, 98, 99 angle. Like guys in masks for no reason, and <laughs> and literally yes. every belt in AAA is being held by a foreigner right now. <laughs> so it's not a particularly unique thing on the AAA side of things to have Americans win their belt, and uh, it's so there's that part of it. And then yeah, there's like the MJF and Darby thing. I thought the MJF angle with Sting was good, and they're also still doing more slow burn stuff with mjf and wardlow but i didn't get the impression that that's like coming to a head soon so in the meantime yeah it's it's a promo and a run-in or a match and a post-match beat down and someone else comes in to run off the heels or you know whatever like that's that's just kind of the formula that most of the shows follows which you know it's not it's not necessarily none of it's bad in a bubble per se um but it doesn't necessarily, it's not like, oh my gosh, this is so innovative. This is so exciting. I really can't wait for next week's show. Like that's not the part of it you're excited for. You're excited for, oh, who's Brian Daniels going to wrestle next week? Like that's, again, better than nothing, but yes. not, but not, it isn't a firing on all cylinders wrestling show right, right now. I think that's fair to say. So one thing that's become more clear to me, the more talent that AEW brings in is the cream just rises to the top. And no pun intended, was watching Rhodes to the top this week and <laughs> watching Cody Rhodes wrestle Malachi Black uh, in the third match of their trilogy, which Cody lost the first two uh, and then won the third with a bunch of shenanigans. But the crowd, the AEW crowd is finally not, I don't want to say finally like he deserves it or anything, but um, 
they've they've pretty clearly turned on Cody and they've kind of built that into storyline on the reality show a little bit and it's playing out on TV and now they are probably leading into it and he's going to be a heel who thinks he's a baby face or whatever the deal is. Is it possible though that just the more talent they bring into this, I'm never going to get a track jacket by the way at this <laughs> with this next statement, but is it possible that just the more talent that they brought into AEW, everyone kind of ends up slotted at their level <laughs> and maybe in a promotion with a bunch of world-class talent, Cody Rhodes is not a main eventer <laughs> or at least not a main event baby face. And the crowd is beginning to see that and they're beginning to turn on him. Or is it all a little more lighthearted and good nature than that? And they just want to boo him to see him play a heel. I can't quite figure out this Cody thing. Yeah, I definitely, I mean, I definitely think that's part of it that they're, it's clear people really like uh, Malachi Black for some reason. And <laughs> they're, I'm sure he's a very nice guy. Um, and so that's the guy they want to see. And they think he's cool and they want to see him kick guys in the head and, and do his cool entrance and, do lore and whatever and <laughs> Cody is the guy standing in the way of that right now so I feel like I feel like they want to see Alice yeah they want to see Malachi Black like they like that guy and they want to see him move up and he's only really feuded with Cody so far and so yeah I think it's a little bit of like maybe they kind of see Cody as like they're hol- he's holding this guy we like back from doing something more interesting <laughs> <laughs> um and like they tried to play up this big storyline of oh cody's lost his mojo and like i didn't feel like this was the begin at least until the the stuff that happened in the match with i didn't feel like that's where it was going it felt like they were trying to go like oh you got booed but now cody's really going to dedicate himself back to wrestling and that's going to turn <laughs> right. the ship around and he still got yeah. booed and then he won and people booed a lot so yeah, it's, <laughs> it could, I think it's, yeah. And it's also that Cody has been a featured player for over two years now that they've, they've been running these, these dynamite shows and yeah, maybe he just doesn't fit what people want when there's Brian Danielson's and Malachi blacks and Adam Cole and all of these top tier and hang. And it's not to say like, Oh, it's just the shiny new toys because like Hangman's been on every show that Cody's been on. And he's one of, if not the most, maybe the second most beloved man in the company behind Danielson right now. Like, so it's not like it's, it's only, you know, the Lucha Bros still get cheered. Like all these guys that have been on the shows since day one, like have, have gotten it. So yeah, maybe it was just the rest of the elite EVP crew. Maybe they saw this coming a little quicker and we're like, well, we'll go heal because clearly there's a lot of baby face talent that's going to be jumping and we'll already be in the correct roles to feed them. Whereas Cody was like, I'm a hero (laughs) and (laughs) I will be one of the heroes. I don't know. It's also Cody's stuff also always feels kind of divorced from the rest of the show, you know, in a weird way, like more so in those early dynamites where it felt like everything else was like a PWG, like pretty modern, like, like nitro esque story. And he was doing like, more old school stuff and then and then it it now now i wouldn't say like from a match standpoint it doesn't necessarily feel that way but his storylines it doesn't feel like anything else it just feels like it exists in its own world it's like okay this is the cody portion of the show we're going to the cody universe for (laughs) for this segment of television and then like it doesn't feel like he would interact well with any of the other storylines going on that don't directly involve him. So maybe that's part of it too. Whereas like the elite guys are like in three different feuds at once. Cause you have whatever Kenny's feud is, you have the bucks feud and then you have, you know, you have Adam Cole's feud now it's like, there's, so there's like it, they kind of are all over the show, but they're all kind of gelling together better. Whereas Cody's stuff still feels like it's on this weird little Island. So maybe that's part of it too, but yeah, for whatever reason, whether or not it's some meta thing at this point or it wasn't, but now it's going to be this meta thing. Um, yeah. I think, I think people really like to boo Cody Rhodes right now. All right. Anything else you want to get into? 
No, I think that covers uh, I think that covers the ground. We talked about my respective women, we talked about the yes. G1, we talked about uh, the most interesting thing to happen in WWE in decades. Like it's uh, it was as always, it's always a packed show, but this week especially. Uh, just some some fun stuff and then there's the new Japan stuff which is less fun, but you know, no shortage of topics either way. Oh, and congratulations to friend of the show, Mickey James, for winning the uh, Impact Knockouts title at uh, Bound for Glory. And congratulations to Impact for doing Impact things and uh, <laughs> treating, the wor- treating the world title twice, screwing Josh Alexander, and uh, uh, teasing Braun Strowman and not delivering him for some reason. So congratulations to the Impact. Congratulations to friend of the show, Mickey James. <laughs> and until next time, uh, I'm Ethan. I'm Liam. We'll be back soon with more stories from the wrestling life. Adios. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Now, here are this week's bonus features. And uh, nice. I went, went to went to Comic Con this weekend, and boy, even with the masks. Just everybody, everybody <laughs> need to wear a little bit more deodorant. <laughs> General rule. Everybody made, everybody made, everybody made fun of GCW or whoever it was that had the deodorant table at the indie wrestling show. But it's like, you know, I think that's a public service. Yeah, and and I don't know. I've always been of the mind of like, if I smelled like that, I would really want someone to tell me, so that I could go get some deodorant or something, or mouthwash yeah. or whatever, like whatever I need to. <laughs> to curb it like i would right. want, i would want to be i would want to i would want to know ahead of time so yeah i think that's you know it's not about shaming anyone it's just like hey just just so you know everyone around you is super uncomfortable every time you look fine <laughs> but it's not about shame it's not mean no. babe, as as Jay Lyle would say <laughs> no we're just playing a trick <laughs> uh Jay's doing like a syndicated game show now. Yeah, I saw that. Well, you know, why not? I mean, that's, that's <laughs> about where a guy is that <laughs> that level of fame goes at this point in his life, right? I mean, except for the part where he has $300 million in the bank or whatever it is. More, maybe. Right. Like, <laughs> I did. Well, I mean, that's the difference between me and most people, though, is like, I don't have the the drive needed to ever reach that level of fame. <laughs> but also if I ever reach that level of fame, it's like, all right, if I make $5 million, I'm moving to Maui and no one will ever see me. Again. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> like, I'm not going to buy an Island. I will live right. there alone. And right. that's it. I'm done. I'll, I'll Skype in for holidays. But that, that's, <laughs> that's it. Yeah, I don't. Uh, that's not something I've ever quite quite grasped. But you know, you know, he's got to yeah, he's got to work. He's got to get parts for all those cars. You know. Yeah, yeah, motor oil. <laughs> you know, he, of course, we've probably talked about this a hundred times. But he famously never he banked all of his Tonight Show money, <laughs> never mm-hmm. touched it. So you know, on and off, he was the host of a Tonight Show for. <laughs> uh, he left at the beginning of 14 and to 13, something Somewhere like that. In there, yeah. So 20 years. Say he averaged $10 million a year. And there were years where he probably made more than that. Mm-hmm. $200 million, $200 million in the bank. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no kids. Yeah. And he's, and he's doing whatever that game show is. And he's got his old, uh, his old guitar guy back. Yeah. Yep, Kevin Eubanks. Yeah, and he's doing. He's got a CNBC car show. Oh yes, yeah. Of course. How can he's we doing forget? great. He's doing great. Oh, what a guy. Well, that's our Jay Leno update. <laughs> Leno Observer Radio pilot episode. <laughs> I've started watching Cheers. Ooh, uh, kind of the prequel to Frasier. Right. Uh, although I'm uh, a season and a half in. 
I think there are like 12 seasons though, or 13 seasons or something ridiculous number, but uh, no Frazier so far. Hmm. <laughs> a season and a half in. I think so. he's like somebody, isn't he like one of the main characters, husbands or ex-husbands or something? I feel like, I feel like that's how he's brought into the show. He... Somebody I follow on Twitter did like a big fresh or uh, big uh, cheers rewatch earlier this I year. See. And I, so I am like relatively well briefed on all of the, <laughs> all of he the was, plot points of cheers. Well, it, it's a plot point in Frasier later, but he was going to marry Diane. Who's like the female lead in cheers. And she left him at the altar. Oh. So I'm assuming, I'm assuming that happens somewhere along the lines here in Cheers, but we're a year and a half in and it hasn't happened yet. So I see. Well, wow. fascinating to you and the listener, I'm That's sure. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh. I try to keep on keeping on.